Hey, what's up, everyone? Thanks for dropping in to another episode here on the Path to Freedom podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Dave Pazgan. Dave, what's up? How are you? Hey, Wes. How are you? Good to see you again, as always. Yeah, man. Really appreciate you making time to do this. You probably don't even remember this, but you were literally the first person that I interviewed on the podcast. So we're coming oh, really? full circle here. I, I, I remember being on, but I didn't know it was the first one. So. Yeah, you were you were my first, um, at least my first interview episode. I may have like put out a couple of kind of solo episodes or whatever in the very beginning, right. but yeah, man, you were episode number one and I'd have to look to see, but you know, we're up into like the mid one hundreds now for, for a number of episodes. So, uh, That's awesome, man. Congratulations to you. Well, Hey, thank you for, uh, coming back for round two, but you know, some interesting things, um, that you've been working on since, uh, since you last came on the podcast. So, you know, you were, you were in a little bit of a kind of a transition mode. Uh, last time we talked, um, you know, you went into a little bit of your background, uh, you know, what you did prior to getting into franchising, uh, what you did at 101 Mobility, which was the first franchise brand that you really, you know, kind of launched and grew into a national brand. And, um, you know, you kind of shared some of your your philosophies on franchising and, and what you were looking to do next, you know, take everything you learned uh, in building 101 mobility and, and apply that to another brand. But at the time we last talked on the podcast, you didn't have another brand that you were working with. Um, and right. you do now, and, and it's a very interesting brand. So, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to spend most of our time on today for anyone listening. Um, I'll post the link to the first interview that that I did with Dave in the show notes if you didn't catch that was literally the first episode so go back and listen to that because I think it'll give you some really good context in terms of Dave's background and and why he's in such a good position to do what he's doing now um, but tell us a little bit about the brand you're working with now um, and you know how how it kind of came to be yeah, so the brand's called Kiddo Kinetics, and it's a youth sports enrichment brand where uh, we go into daycares, preschools, Montessori's, and places like that, and we offer a sports-based uh, enrichment program that usually is like 30 to 45 minutes. We work with kids that are as young as 18 months all the way up to 12 years, but most of the work we do is with kids between two and six, and the way it came about is I... Uh, uh, a little over two years ago now, uh, a good friend of mine, Frank Milner from Tudor Doctor, uh, introduced me to Terry Braun, who's the founder of Kiddo Kinetics. And Terry had uh, been running the business for a little over 20 years. So she started Kiddo Kinetics in her native South Africa, is where she's from. And that's actually how she knew Frank, because Frank's also from South Africa. So uh, they kind of had that connection. And when uh, I left my last post at 101, you know, Frank was aware I was looking for something new to work on and uh, thought of Terry and said, well, here's somebody that's got a great brand, a really good business. She needs a partner to help her grow it. And she's been actively kind of looking for somebody to help her with that. And so he put us together and I met Terry at IFA actually in 2020. And so I sat with her and her husband, Steve, for a couple of hours and uh, got, you know, got to know each other a little bit. I got to learn a little bit about the brand. And uh, I kind of, you know, after that meeting, I was like, man, she's got, she's got a, a really strong opportunity here uh, because I, I have some insight into the youth sports enrichment market a bit. And, you know, I could tell like she just had, had all the pieces to, uh, you know, have a really strong brand. But the challenge was she was trying to do it all by herself. So she yeah. had started franchising uh, in 2008, uh, opened her first franchise in Dallas, Texas. And, you know, that franchise was still around, actually still operating and still is today. It is our you know biggest franchise currently. Um, and so she had gotten to three franchise locations when, by the time that I had met her. Uh, but, you know, she was trying to do everything by herself. When she started franchising, she was running her own local business uh, in South Florida. Uh, she was raising a young family. She's, you know, had young kids at home and uh, you know, I was also trying to launch a franchise all at the same time with no partners or anybody else really to help her. And so it's no big shock that, you know, she was struggling to kind of get traction with it just because, you know, she needed resources, she needed, you know, support and, and that kind of things and yeah. those kinds of things. And so that was a bit of a struggle. So uh, in the background, I'd also, you know, I knew a lot about another youth sports brand uh, called Soccer Shots, which is uh, headed up by a really good friend of mine. 
And I knew what their business looked like. And it was, you know, what Kiddo Kinetics could look like at scale, in my opinion. You know, they were, they had 150 franchise owners, like 230 territories. They were doing really well, uh, growing really quickly. There was a big demand for their services. And they offered basically the same kind of program as Kiddo Kinetics, except that it's just a soccer program and Kiddo Kinetics does multiple sports. And so I thought, well, there's a you know big market opportunity. Uh, and in talking with Justin and Soccer Shots, you know, he agreed that you know, there's a lot of green space in that industry and a lot of room for, you know, more kind of organized competition or participants. And uh, so I, and then I kind of looked under the hood and looked at her, you know, business model and, you know, her profitability and how her franchises were doing. And I said, I just don't see anything here that I don't like. And so um, it just all kind of lined up. And I would say the other big factor for me is back when I went to college at Penn State, my degree was in health education and exercise physiology. So I kind of had a sort of a natural interest in that space and uh, always, you know, wanted to have always wanted to be involved in businesses that not only are profitable, but also do some good in the world. Yeah. And that was a big part of my, you know, my uh, nexus at, at 101, you know, helping people that have disabilities or have trouble getting around. I think that was the, you know, box that I wanted to check for the second time and in, in doing another franchise was to get into another business that, you know, I think helps people and does some good in the world. And, you know, that old adage of, you know, doing well by doing good. Yeah. Well, and it's a fun business, right? I mean, it's kids having fun, getting exercise. It's great for the kids. Hey, it's great for the parents too, right? I've got three young kids now and uh, yeah, I will yeah. pay very, very good money <laughs> to say, Hey, someone's going to take my kids, let them run around, you know, learn a different sport. You know, it's going to be supervised and somewhat structured. So it's, yeah, I will pay very good money for that. Um, and, and so, you know, I I appreciate you sharing some of the backstory because I think it's important for, for listeners to understand. And so I worked with a young couple, uh, last year up in Pennsylvania, um, that ended up, buying a kiddo kinetics franchise and so you know just through knowing you dave and then you know through working with them and kind of learning more about the business through the the research that they were doing um it's it's a great opportunity and i remember you know as i was first having conversations with this young couple about it i i kind of explained some of this backstory to them because it's it's a very unique opportunity in several ways one is as you mentioned, Terry, the founder, uh, she's been in business for 20 some years, right? So on paper, you know, Kiddo Kinetics would probably be concert- considered an emerging brand. And by emerging, I mean, you know, that's based on the number of franchisees, the number of locations that are operating. And, and we can go into kind of what some of the current numbers are, you know, here in a few minutes, if you want, but it, it, it at surface level looks like it's a brand new concept and, and it's just getting started. But in reality, that's not the case. You've got a founder with 20 plus years of experience that's been running the business locally in her area. You've also got franchisees that have been in business, some of them since 2008. And, you know, you pointed out that the, the franchisee in Dallas was still around, which is a really good indication that the business is good Um, And then you've got someone like yourself that can kind of come in, you know, you've got this experience in building a franchise organization. So, you know, you've already learned a lot of what to do, what not to do. You also have contacts, right? Um, You know, a lot of people within franchising. And so, you know, that's some of what Terry didn't have. And that's not her fault. She just had never done it before. And so it's really, I think, a little bit of the best of both worlds in the sense that, you know, you get an opportunity to to get into a business that does have a pretty good track record and a founder that that really knows this business inside and out. But then you've got someone that has extensive franchise experience as well. And then there's a lot of benefits to, you know, getting in with something that is a little earlier stage, right? Territory availability, right? It's an opportunity yeah. to kind of get in ground floor and, and grow with it. So, Um, I I think that's really important for, for people to understand. Uh, and it's one of the things in, in my eyes that makes it such a a unique opportunity, but, um, I mean, talk, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, youth sports and, and, you know, from what you see, you know, why is this a, 
a business that people would want to consider getting into? Yeah, well, we, there's actually a really good article that just came out. I think Forbes magazine or something. I'll send it to you after. But uh, there's a little highlight about the industry. Uh, it's currently at 19.2 billion is the size of the industry. That's bigger than the NFL. And so that's wow. the youth, youth sports market. And in that article, they referenced uh, companies like Soccer Shots and I9 Sports and, and things along those lines. And, uh, you know, it's it's still a very, very fragmented market. So we see, uh, feel like there's a really big opportunity to build a strong brand and a very recognizable brand in the space. Uh, just to give you a sense of it, like Soccer Shots and I9 are, are really the only like scaled recognized brands in the space. Yeah. And that's in a $19 billion industry, right? And then both of those brands are, you know, so somewhere sub a hundred million in terms of system-wide revenue. So that tells you just how, how fragmented the market is. Yeah. And so the market's just begging for more organized, you know, uh, players to come into the space and, and provide these services. And what's really driving it is uh, a, a number of kind of macro factors. One of them is that, you know, people are really concerned about kids not getting enough exercise or not learning those healthy, active habits when they're young. And, you know, screen time's a problem. And 80% mm -hmm. uh, of uh, school age children have two working parents. So they've got, you know, their day is full, right? They don't really yeah. have time to, to play with their kids. And so parents are concerned about that and they want to make sure that, you know, the kids are getting those opportunities. We've actually uh, done a lot of digging into the neuroscience behind brain development and how it's impacted by, you know, early uh, activity habits and learning sports and fine and gross motor skills when you're, you know, two, three, four years old, it actually has a significant impact on how your brain develops. And kids that aren't getting those opportunities are being put at a disadvantage because they, their brain develops differently. It's harder for them to learn it later. Uh, they develop less emotional skills, less social mm -hmm. skills. Um, so it's really not just about teaching kids new sports. Uh, you know, when I met Terry and I, I kind of dug into the business, my first impression was, hey, we teach sports to little kids. That's great. And what I've learned since then is it's just a, a lot more important than that uh, in terms of, you know, getting them into these active habits early in life and, and those kinds of things. And so the there's a ton of demand for these services right now, especially post COVID. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of d during COVID, the business was impacted, not, you know, in a devastating way, but there was an impact. And sure. so some of the schools, just like everywhere around the country started limiting, you know, vendors coming in and things along those lines. And what we're finding is right now, the timing is actually really good, good to be starting a new business in this space because there's a ton of pent up demand. Like everyone in the space is really growing quickly and our new franchises that are opening now are finding the doors are open and right up for them because there's just a demand for it. And there's just not a lot of great, you know, players in the space. And so uh, it's a definitely growing industry. It's, it's already got some scale and, you know, there's the old adage that there's two things that people will always spend plenty of money on and that's pets and kids. And yeah. so, you know, you can, <laughs> you can almost not go wrong in those two categories because people will just pour money you know, into those, into those, uh, categories to take care of their pets and their kids, you know? Yeah. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, talking about pent up demand, my wife, uh, Kelly, who, you know, she, she literally just signed our, our oldest daughter who's five. She's just signed her up for like four or five, uh, camps over the summer, right? Like a dance camp, right. a, a music camp, like, because we don't want her sitting at the house all day. Uh, you know, where the temptation is going to be to watch TV or, you know, we haven't gotten her an iPad or anything, but she's asking for one because her friends have one. And it's like, we want her to, to be active and we, you know, do our best to, you know, get out and play with the kids and stuff like that. But we've got other stuff going on too. So um, definitely the pent up demand. I know you listed, you know, some of the types of organizations that kiddo kinetics could, could go in and, and work with or partner with, but Maybe kind of walk us through what are some of the different, um, you know, types of places that, you know, a kiddo kinetics franchisee should be looking to to make connections with. Sure. So, so just to kind of lay it out, I guess the, the main offering that we have is what we call enrichment programming. And what we mean by that is we're going into these venues and offering a program that parents will typically pay extra, you know, or pay us directly to have their children participate in and where we go would be like daycares preschools montessori schools combination of both independent operators that have maybe one or uh, you know a few locations in a given market 
uh, or the chains like the Goddard schools and the mm -hmm. Ivy schools and, you know, those kinds of places, Kid, you know, KLA, Kids Learning Academy. Uh, we work with all of those types of venues. And what's kind of cool about it is these are year round schools, right? So they're daycares and preschools that parents work year round. So the kids are there year round. Mm -hmm. And so we go in and typically offer a 10 week program. Uh, and it's uh, usually about 30 to 40 minutes per class. Okay. And the model is that we try to do two classes consecutively, bro usually broken down by age group. So if we're going into a Montessori school, for example, we'll maybe go in on a Tuesday and do a 930 class for the twos and threes, and then a 10 o'clock class for the fours and fives. And we usually have somewhere between eight and 12 children participating in each class. Uh, and then the kids, you know, pay on a per class basis. But when the parents sign up, they buy the block of 10 at one time. Ah, and so okay. that's kind of our economic model. So when you look at, you know, 10 or 12 kids paying, you know, each to be in that individual class, and then you run two classes together. So you've got an hour long block, you know, 930 to 1030, where you're running two classes. So you're sending a coach in, uh, you know, to that, uh, to run those two classes. And the revenue uh, ratio is really, or the gross margin ratio is really high, you know, because you've got an hourly employee coach kind of putting on a class and you're teaching maybe as many as 25 kids over that period of time. Yeah. And so uh, the it leads to really high gross margins. And so where we tend to do the best are in the, you know, the Montessori's really get it easily yeah. uh, because Montessori schools are already sort of, you know, geared towards this enrichment type of programming. So they yeah. really like it. Uh, and then, you know, the Kitty Academies, the Goddard schools, you know, they, they, they already kind of know how this works for the most part, because a lot of times they are working with either, you know, another local provider or soccer shots or somebody like that. And so it's actually pretty easy to sell because we go in and say, well, hey, we're, we're not here to replace, you know, soccer shots, for example, by any means. We're just here to provide an alternative because most parents don't sign up their children for five seasons of soccer shots in a year. They'll do one or two. And so what are they doing when the rest of the time they're looking for options, right? They're looking for other things to do. Yeah. What I could see, like, so, so the preschool that my daughter goes to soccer shots um, is there. I could see, you know, as long as it was different days of the week, having her do soccer shots on a Tuesday and kiddo kinetics on a Thursday, you know, yeah. um, I, I think a lot of parents would look at it that way. So and it's, it's, you know, like you said, it's not a hard sell. Um, and at the end of the day, it doesn't cost these, these schools or these organizations any money to have you come in. So you're not even really selling. You're coming in and just offering them a way that they can turn around and add more value to, you know, the parents and, and the kids that are attending their, their school. If you're listening to this podcast, then there's a good chance that you're looking to create more freedom in your own life. There's also a good chance that you realize that owning your own business can be a great way to take more control of your livelihood and create more of that freedom that we're all looking for. Also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you realize that I specialize in franchise ownership. In addition to owning franchise businesses myself, I have a franchise consulting firm, Path to Freedom where I help people navigate what is typically an overwhelming process of understanding franchising, identifying specific franchise companies that could be a fit, and then conducting the due diligence in a thorough and efficient manner with those franchise brands. My whole purpose here is to leverage my experience working for franchisors, owning franchises myself, and how we've been able to use that to create more freedom in our lives and help you determine if that could be a path that makes sense for you as well. So if any of this sounds interesting, if you've considered business ownership in the past, whether you've explored franchising specifically or not, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to learn more about you and what it is that you're working towards in your life and determine if I may be in a position to help. A great starting point is the link below in the show notes, which will take you to a short form to fill out and you'll receive a free copy of an ebook that I've put together, The Seven Steps to Freedom Through Franchise Ownership. That'll also get us connected and I'd love to set up an introductory call where I can explain a little bit more about the process that I use to help people determine if franchise ownership could be a great way to start charting their own path to freedom. So click the link below in the show notes, receive the ebook, and let's get connected. I'd love to hear from you.
Um, I know one thing that I learned, you know, more recently about kiddo kinetics is there's actually an angle, at least in some areas where, and, and you can probably expand on this better than I can, but uh, apparently a lot of school systems have had to um, cut out their, their PE programs. And so there's actually an opportunity in some cases for kiddo kinetics to come in and kind of be like an outsourced PE provider. Yeah, that's right. So for example, a lot of private schools, you know, they're unlike a public school, they may have 300 to 500 kids enrolled at a school. And so they're not going to run, you know, they don't really have a need for a full-time PE teacher. Yeah. And so they may be teaching four to five, six hours of PE a, a week. And it's really hard for them to staff a position for just that few number of hours. You know, it doesn't justify full-time and nobody really wants to work just four or five hours a week. And so sometimes they try to get the teachers of other subjects to, to teach the classes. But in many cases, those teachers don't feel comfortable. Like they don't feel like they've been trained properly. They don't. Yeah. They could use a break, quite honestly. Uh, yeah. Schools are really struggling. If you read anything in the newspapers about, well, it's probably every industry, but schools and, and daycares in particular uh, are also struggling with staffing, right? So we actually help them with the staffing perspective where we come in and, you know, basically take a little bit of the pressure off. If, if at a minimum, it's four to six hours a week of taking the kids off your hands and teaching them sports, you know, that's that's helpful to those schools. And so there's definitely that, you know, that angle and that demand. And in the public schools, there's been a, you know, a lot of cutbacks away from all kinds of enrichment, not just sports, but, you know, music programs, arts programs, all of that's been, you know, the funding there has been limited. Uh, there's, you know, been some, uh, I guess, uh, I would say governmental programs over the last 10 years or so that have influenced some of that, where they're trying to get kids to do better on, you know, their scores and, and things like that, the testing. Mm -hmm. And so they're reallocating resources more towards the STEM side of things, which is not unimportant, sure. but it comes at the expense of the enrichment. So, you know, the music, the arts and the sports kind of get second fiddle and parents are concerned about it. And so yeah. we not only work in, you know, the private schools and the private daycares, but we actually also go in and work with uh, a lot of times we, we do it through the PTA or PTO, mm. but we'll go in and work with public schools uh, because the other factor is, is a lot of these schools now are running aftercare programs. Uh, when I was in school, there was no such thing, right? The school was over at two, you went home. Yeah. If your parents, if both parents worked, somebody had to, some caregiver had to come get you. Right. And what's the case now is most of these schools, elementary schools have aftercare programs where you can keep your kids from in school from two to five or six and then pick them up later. And so now we're looking for, well, what do we do with these kids for these hours? Right. The teachers are tired, right? <laughs> teachers got there at 630 to start teaching at seven. Yeah. And so the last, Last thing they want to do is keep running it out until six o'clock, right? So no uh, we go into these uh, aftercare programs and offer our our services. And again, it's parent paid. Uh, but the pitch to the PTA is think of it as a fundraiser because we can do revenue share with them. So, you know, we say, hey, we'll give you a percentage of our revenue. They That helps them to promote the program in the school. And uh, I was out in Dallas visiting with our franchise out there uh, or a couple of uh, about a month ago or so. And he had, uh, we went to a public school in, in the uh, Richardson area in Dallas where he's, he's operating. And they were running two consecutive volleyball classes that each had, I think the combined enrollment for those classes was like 26 kids wow. at a public school. And they worked it through the PTA. Hmm. And so, you know, really good revenue for them. It produces a little bit of uh, fundraising opportunity for, this, for the PTA. They're using those funds to actually buy more sports equipment for the school. And so it's kind of a win-win all the way around. And then the teachers are, you know, happy to have the kids taken out and play volleyball for an hour so they don't have to, you know, keep keep an eye on them. Babysit them, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's so interesting, right? Because I mean, kind of kind of kind of like you, you know, when I first heard you were getting involved with this, like, yeah, okay, it's coming in and you know, teaching little kids some different sports, letting them try different things. But you know, there's really a lot of layers to this and a lot of different ways that kiddo kinetics can come in and add value uh and as you just pointed out it's not only adding value to the parents and the kids it's also in many cases really adding value to the schools and and some of these organizations themselves so i would imagine a lot of people listening to this are wondering okay you know i see now why this business could make sense why there's a need for it so so what is my role as a kiddo kinetics franchise owner look like and and i know there's there's 
couple different ways that someone could approach it in terms of, you know, how they're spending their time as an owner, but walk us through kind of, you know, what, what that should look like from your perspective. And, and I guess what type of franchise owners um, do you feel kiddo kinetics is really looking for? Yeah, great. So we, we have a pretty good variety of different sort of structural options um, starting with basically the owner operator, you know, the, uh, at least getting started, you're the candidate that you brought us from Pittsburgh that you mentioned, uh, you know, she's a perfect profile of kind of what we're looking for there. So she's a young mom. She had a corporate job before having kids, she took time off to have a couple of kids. She's got a sports background. She was a collegiate athlete yeah. and she just has an, an affinity and a passion for it. And so, uh, she's running the business firsthand. This is her full-time gig and in, in running it. And so she's right now out, you know, doing demonstrations and starting to build her, her pipeline of schools that she's starting to work with. She actually did her first demo a couple of days ago and landed the account on the spot. And so she's off and running. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and she'll, you know, she'll do everything from teach some classes and do some demos in the early stages. But as soon as she starts to get some scale, then she'll start, you know, hiring coaches. She's already hired, I think two coaches already. And so they'll be the ones that are really out teaching the classes so that she can focus on uh, scaling the business. And there's really two aspects of scaling. One of them is business development. So somebody mm -hmm. that's going out and, you know, knocking on doors and talking to the schools and building the account base. And then there's the logistics and operations end of it. And so as these businesses get bigger, uh, what tends to happen is they end up hiring uh, uh, maybe one or, or more full-time coaches that kind of act as like a team leader or a coach director. And so they're not only doing a lot of classes because they're full time, uh, but they're also helping to manage some of the logistics and other factors uh, locally so that the owner can take that, take a little pressure off the owner and let them go out and continue to do business development. So, um, so that team seems to work pretty well. And that's kind of that owner operator model. And then, you know, the next level up would be semi absentee. So that's somebody that's maybe bringing in a manager uh, and was going to work with the manager to kind of do the groundwork. I've actually done that myself. So I, I have three territories in Tampa. Uh, I hired a manager in Tampa to run that business. I don't live in Tampa. I'm never in Tampa. So <laughs> it's completely hands off for me. Yep. And um, he's off and running. He started in uh, December and uh, is extremely busy already, um, especially right now in the spring is when we start to get a, a lot of activity because people are gearing up for summer camps Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in addition right now, you know, the, a uh, lot of more doors are opening because people are just less worried about, you know, pandemic related issues. And so, and there's this pent up demand. So, you know, when we're knock, knocking on these doors today, you know, these schools are saying, Hey, you know, we need you now, right? Yeah. It's been, a, it's been a long time. Can you start and tomorrow? So that, yeah. And so yeah. that's the sort of semi absentee model where, you know, you've got a manager, you know, you're managing that manager. We help you with that. We actually run. Uh, you know, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with traction, but we run the EOS traction model yep. and we actually teach our franchises to run that. And so if you're a, a, a semi absentee and you're operating it with a manager, uh, we basically help your manager run traction. So we do traction meetings every other week uh, with all of our uh, management team, uh, you know, the field managers, and we run it just straight out of the book. Like we do the level tens, we do all of that type of stuff. We do quarterly meetings, we set goals. Uh, there's high levels of accountability, and uh, that's actually been working really well for us uh, so far. So, so that's another way you can do it. And then the third way, which is a new option that we're rolling out in our FDD that's about to be released next month, uh, is a pure investor model where you can basically you know, acquire territory and then hand over the keys to us. We'll find and hire a manager on your behalf. Uh, we will manage that manager the same way that we work with the current managers that are semi-absentee. Uh, and just, you know, put them through the paces, help them grow the business, do the marketing, uh, and essentially run the entire show. And that, in that case, then the owner is really more of a pure investor. You know, we report to them, you know, regularly, you know, on how things are going across certain KPIs, obviously financials, uh, and all of those kinds of things. And so we, we did find that there's been some interest in, you know, like from some professional athletes and so on. And, yeah. you know, an NFL player doesn't really have time to even be semi absentee. Right. So no. that's where we're getting, you know, interest from those parties. And, and we said, well, we really need a, a pure investor model. And we're such a hands-on franchisor that that's actually pretty easy for us to execute on. Yeah. You're already doing the, the traction meetings with, you know, the other managers and stuff. You can, 
I would imagine pretty easily, you know, plug people in and, and that, you know, that investor model is unique, right? Because you don't really have many of those options in franchising. I mean, I have so many conversations with people that, you know, the, the thought of owning a franchise is appealing to them because they want to add another revenue stream. They want to, you know, build an asset. They want to diversify, but you know, it's something I've got to make sure that there's realistic expectations, right? Like there are no really, for the most part, no completely passive franchise investments, right? They're all right. for the most part, semi absentee at best. And every franchisor that claims to be semi absentee has a different definition of what semi absentee actually means, right? So I've got to, you know, really have some good conversations with people to make sure there's realistic expectations. So, you know, you roll out something like this investor model, there's a lot of people out there that that are going to be intrigued by by an option like that. Um, yeah, and our, and our management agreement structure is really flexible. So you can start that way if you want. You know, I've, we certainly I know you talk to plenty of candidates that say, hey, I want to I want to get into my own business. I'm not ready to leave my job. I don't know how much time I have to allocate it. I'll take all the help I can get. And this might be a good option for them where they say, all right, well, for the first year, we'll run it for you. And then you can pick it up after that. It's not a sure. long term contract. It's a the management agreement is a two year agreement, but there's a 90 day out. And okay. so if you say, hey, I'm ready to take this thing over and I want to come in and run it myself, then we just you just let us know and we, you know, execute the termination of the management agreement, hand over the keys to you. We still keep working with your manager. Uh, you know, we still keep running the level tens and all the things that we do there. But, um, you know, you've got a little bit, you know, the owner then is a little bit more hands on kind of directly managing the manager, you know, maybe running their payrolls and things along those lines. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, and I assume they're uh, part of that management agreement is they're just they're paying you a, a set fee per month, or is it an additional percentage of revenue or is it variable? Yeah, it's 2000 a month, we charge okay. two grand a month to, to manage it for you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And, and like I said, you know, unique compared to most of what you'll see out there in franchising. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, the the structure of the business right so you know you've already established that you know you're going into these schools and and facilities to do the the classes so a kiddo kinetics franchise does not need a physical location to actually operate the business out of right. is that correct yeah that's right at, at most you need a like a storage locker uh 10 like a 10 by 10 is plenty yeah. to get started um, all of our equipment easily fits into 100 square feet. And, you know, some of them even run it out of their garage. But, you know, unless you want coaches, not, you know, knocking on your door at 6 a.m. to come get equipment, <laughs> you know, garage might not be the best option. And so it's yeah. pretty inexpensive and easy to get a storage unit and, you know, give your coaches access so that they can go in and get the equipment that they need. Other than that, the business is entirely home based. And so we go to the schools like we don't have a facility. We're not carrying the brick and mortar expense. And so we go to those venues and actually put the classes on there. One of the questions that people ask me a lot is, well, how does that work in, you know, maybe colder climates? Like, can you play outside in the colder climates? And the reality is actually in most of the country, uh, unless it's nice out, our classes are inside anyways. Like even mm -hmm. in South Florida, where Terry got started, uh, you know, Fort Lauderdale in July isn't exactly the most, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a accommodating place to be, right? And yeah, so, you want some AC. You know, Floridians are sort of used to that, so it's not that big of a deal. But um, all of these schools, daycares, preschools, Montessori's, they all have a, usually some activity space that's, that's that's set aside. And we typically operate in those spaces. And then when we work with, uh, we actually are starting to do a lot more business now with parks and recreations departments. And so we go meet with the parks and rec and we, you know, leverage their facility. So whether that be outdoor at the park or actually uh, in, you know, many communities now have built these, you know, really nice multi-million dollar rec centers and the directors of those rec centers, their main mission is utilization. Like let's get people in here using these things. We didn't want to spend, you know, 20 million building this great facility and have nobody showing up. Yeah. And so they're looking for programming. And a lot of times they offer some of their own programming, but what we find is that uh, most of the parks and recs don't offer programs for the really young kids. Mm -hmm. Most of them start at six and up. And so there's all kinds of stuff if you're six and up, but there's really nothing for, you know, the 18 month up to maybe four or five years or very limited offerings. 
Uh, and so we'll come in and in many cases use their facilities. Sometimes they want us to either pay them a flat rate or do a revenue share. Sometimes sure. they, they don't care and they don't want to charge anything. Like in our location in Cincinnati just launched uh, nine enrichment programs uh, with the local parks departments. And they're like, you can use our facilities for free. Just We just want people to use them. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's not always yeah. the case. That's sure, not always but, the case, but, and even when, even, yeah, even when there's a revenue share, you just, you just build it into your pricing. So it's really well, that, and it's, factor. it's still a lot less than, you know, having a, a lease that you have to pay every month for a big facility, whether it's being used or not. Right. And so that, you know, that's another thing that, that really makes this an attractive business, right? Very little overhead in terms of fixed expenses, especially when you're starting out, you know, as, as this thing scales, you probably are looking at having some full-time employees and stuff. So you're going to have, you know, a bit of a fixed payroll, but you know, what I like about this is because you, you kind of hit, hit on this earlier, the, the economics on like a per class basis, right? You got one coach instructor, probably an hourly employee and up to 25 paying customers per class, right? So it's very similar business model wise to like boutique fitness, right? Which there's no shortage of franchise opportunities in the boutique fitness um, space. And that's what a lot of people like about it, right? Is the the employee to client ratios are, are great and it's recurring revenue. Um, but those can right. get pretty expensive to, to launch because you've got brick and mortar, uh, probably a build out or a remodel depending on the type of boutique fitness business you're in, there's a lot of equipment expenses. I mean, you guys are what bringing in some, some, some balls and some cones and, you know, the little jerseys that they wear. And that's, that's probably yeah. about it. Um, you know, not, not a crazy yeah, amount. The equipment and, package is two thousand. It's $2,000 for the equipment package to get started. So yeah, that's, all you need. that's like one, one high tech bike for like a, a spin studio right. or something like that. Right. Exactly. Um, so, you know, point is lower initial investment, comparatively speaking to many of the other franchise options out there, very low overhead. The other big takeaway I want people to get from this is the business can absolutely be scaled. I think sometimes people look at these types of businesses because they hear things like home-based or, you know, other of those terms, and they just kind of imagine like, okay, seems like a cool business could be fun. I see that there's some demand, but you know, can this really be built into a, a large business? And, you know, if you have an owner that, that that's their goal and they're leveraging, you know, all the support and resources that, that you guys have put in place, this can absolutely, you know, be built into a, a substantial business. And because of the low overhead nature of the business, the margin opportunity is very strong. Um, yeah, so it's this, really solid. I mean, the, the other big factor is recurring revenue. So once you yeah. get into a school, you tend to stay there for a long, long time. Uh, and, you know, the acquisition cost of an institutional customer is really low because it's mostly grassroots marketing, right? If there's a 150 preschools and daycares in a territory, that's a relatively finite, small universe of people that you've got to go talk to, right? So uh, we do a lot of, we call it swinging doors. You know, we do some direct mail and we do social media and some other things, but the main way to get business is go swing doors. So you just go to the schools and knock on the door and walk in and say, here's who we are. Here's what we do. If they're already working with another enrichment program, it's even that much easier because they already get it. That's right. And so there's yeah. generally not a lot of resistance. And then once you get in there, you know, you're offering your program year round. We usually do four or five seasons a year, depending on, you know, what their school, how their school is, you know, set up from a calendar standpoint. And it's year after year. So once we're in there, we're in there. And that's, you know, when we look at the competitors in the marketplace, you know, that's how they've scaled their businesses, like, you know, soccer shots, for example. I mean, their biggest locations are multi million dollar locations. And the way they do it is it's all incremental business. Every new school you get adds to the bunch of schools that you already have. And so that's essentially how it scales up. And the math on the, you know, on the, the gross margins is pretty simple. I mean, it's pretty easy to figure out if you've got, you know, 10 or 50, 10 or so kids paying 15 bucks to be in a class or their parents paying $15 for them to participate in a class. And that's 30 minutes. And you do two of those back to back. And, uh, you know, so you got a nine 30 to 10 30 block of time. 
<clears throat> you're mar- matching that up against what you have to pay a coach to go in there and teach for an hour. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty big gross margin, right? So it's not hard to figure that out. And that a lot of that information is like really easy to derive. Like what, you know, what, what goes in, you know, what works in your market is as easy as looking up our competitors' websites because almost all of them offer their enrollment online and you can uh-huh. see how much it costs, right? So you can see exactly where they are, when they are, how often they're there and what they're charging. So it's, that visibility into your competitors is really, really easy uh, just because of the nature of the way the signups work. And so yeah. uh, there's not a lot of mystery. When you go into a school that's already offering soccer shots, you already know how much the kids are paying and you know how many kids are enrolled. It even says that on there. Like we know how many wow. kids they'll take. And then sometimes it'll say, hey, <laughs> oh, 10 spots available, three spots left. You know, so it's like, it's pretty. Yeah, that data information is, is there. And it's pretty easy to understand. Yeah. No, I love it, yeah. man. And, and, and so we. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, as yeah, you're talking. Say we, so we, that's one of the things we. We've got a delay. Okay. We've got a delay. We keep talking over each other. Um we'll, we'll, uh, we'll clean that up a little bit. Um, but no, as, as you were talking, um, you know, especially about the grassroots part, um, you know, that's an important thing for people to understand too. Right. Cause like you and I both own a shelf genie franchise, which has a lot in common in terms of how the business model is structured. You know, it's, it's home based. You don't need a location. Most of the franchisees in that business don't even have any W2 employees. So they're, their payroll is not even a fixed expense, but we spend a lot of money on marketing and advertising in that business. And so that is that is one of the biggest variables that impacts a franchisee's bottom line is how much does it cost you to acquire a new client? There's not any predictable recurring revenue in a business like right. that. And you also have to have good salespeople, right? Because you are yeah. selling a pretty high ticket item that's not a need to have for most people. Um, So while it can still be a very good and a very lucrative business, you know, you compare that to Kiddo Kinetics, where especially over time, you should have very little marketing and advertising budget, I would think, because so much of it is grassroots and just networking. And as long as you're doing a good job with the classes, you know, there's no reason for those schools not to keep coming back year over year. So it's really an interesting like blend of, of some of, you know, the, the brick and mortar type franchises that have a lot of appeal to to people, as well as some of the service-based franchises that have a lot of appeal to people. It's, it's a really, really interesting model and there's not much out there like it. Yeah, I think that's right. Like I I say all the time, the lifetime value of a customer is really high because, you know, these are five, 10 year long relationships. Once you get into a school, you're there for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but one other thing I just want to have you talk a little bit about, cause I know this is something that you've had a big impact on since you joined kiddo kinetics. Um, and I know you're, you're borrowing a lot of what you learned over the years at one one mobility and applying it here. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you're supporting kiddo kinetics franchisees you already talked a little bit about traction and and helping you know those franchisees that have managers but you know talk to us a little bit about the the ramp up support um i know you've done some really cool things with technology to help streamline you know day-to-day management uh give us a, a little bit on the support piece yeah so i guess i'll start with just my philosophy that i've i guess adopted in franchising over time is that there's a lot of benefits to being a very hands-on franchisor. And so we talk to our franchises constantly. We use actually Slack as the main way we communicate with franchises, which we find a lot more efficient than email. And so it just allows us to talk to them constantly. So every location has their own channel in Slack and we're talking to them daily most of the time Mm. uh, on various different things. And and also it gives us a platform to share, you know, best practices and, and wins and successful stories and things of that nature. Uh, so if we start with that, right? We want to be super hands-on. Uh, there's nothing that you can ask us for that we hopefully can't provide for you. And if anything, we're probably more annoying than anything else because they're like, hey, will these guys just leave me alone? Like they're constantly <laughs> like, hey, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? And so um, that's just our kind of our, our, our philosophy when it comes to franchise support. 
So to put some meat on that bone, we, we have built a proprietary business management system called Kiddo Link, but we built from the ground up. Uh, we own the code and the importance of that to the franchise owner is that we have complete flexibility to make that system do whatever we want. So we've yeah. already, we, we kind of launched it and all of our locations are now using it uh, over the last probably three or four months. And we've already had a couple dozen of enhancement requests that have been like, hey, could you, you know, can you set up a subscription plan? Hey, can we make it a variable where you can charge for a t-shirt or not charge for a t-shirt or whatever? Mm -hmm. And so we go, yeah, we can do really anything we want. It's just a matter of development hours and, you know, resources and time. And so for the most part, we've been able to address most of that really quickly. And it's not like when you're working off of a third party platform where, you know, if they've got thousands of customers, you got to wait for enough of them to ask for that enhancement to get it done. We just do whatever makes sense for us. And so we own the code and that just makes that really easy. And so we built in such a way so that the franchise doesn't really have to operate in any other systems. They can run everything right through there uh, with the exception of payroll and accounting. Um, mm -hmm. But for, you know, setting up schools and enrolling parents and, you know, merchant services, it's integrated completely with Stripe for sending invoices and collecting payments from parents and, and all of that. It's a one-stop shop. You manage your coach schedules there, all of that. Uh, yeah. And so uh, that's, a, that's a really important part of it. And then on the you know marketing development side, we've developed a 15-week launch plan uh, that goes down to the day. Uh, it's, it's a guideline, right? So you don't have to necessarily do what says it's supposed to do on day 27. Yeah. But it does go down to that level and it says, all right, on day four of week three, these are the things you need to be doing. You need to talk to this many schools. You need to be you know doing this from a recruiting standpoint. You need to do whatever, right? Um, we're also about to roll out a direct mail uh, marketing program that is designed to warm up the market while the franchise is in uh, training. Nice. And so uh, we call it lumpy mail. So we'll be sending out a, uh, a kind of a thick piece of mail that goes out to every executive director at daycare preschool. Awesome. And they get that. And, you know, hopefully it at least starts the conversation, right? They open it up. They see Kiddo, Kiddo Kinetics. And maybe they call, maybe they don't, but at least when you walk in there for the first time, they'll have heard of you. That's right. They'll yep. be recognizable and that type of thing. So, uh, and then we also go out in the field. So the day we open or within a few weeks of opening, uh, we drop everything, run out into the field with that franchise, take them by the hand and say, let's go call on schools. And we spend two or three days just knocking on doors. There's a whole it. lot of other stuff that we do, but those are kind of the highlights. Yeah, it's huge. Um, it's it's huge. I love that you're doing, you know, some of the the priming of the market while the franchisees are in training, creating some of that brand awareness. The technology piece is is huge. You know, for for someone that's never owned a franchise, that may not sound like it's you know that huge of a deal. But having a proprietary software that's that's comprehensive for really everything the franchisee needs for the business and where you know, the franchisor has the ability to, you know, make enhancements and, and tweaks to it. That's, that's invaluable, right? We've got that at Shelf Genie. Um, the other franchise that we own, it's an off the shelf software, right? There's no right. ability to change it. Um, it works well for some things. As an example, though, it's not a CRM, right? So now what you have is all these franchisees, some of them are running without a CRM. And then you've got franchisees, they're using every CRM under the sun, right? Everyone's got something different. And so there's no, right. uh, there's no consensus. It's just, it's kind of a cluster. Um, and, and so anyways, wanted to, to highlight that because that's, that's really important. But um, look, I, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but this has been, this has been awesome. This is an exciting opportunity. Um love seeing what what you guys are doing with it so far and and i have zero doubt whatsoever that you know this will be you know the next nationally recognized you know brand in youth sports and um you know i i think it's the type of business that you know may not grab someone's attention if they just kind of you know saw an ad for it online or something like that but you know hearing you know, your insight and your perspective and really just, you know, how many layers there are to this business and why it can make sense. Um, I, I think this is the type of business that a lot of people could really, really find interesting for them. Um, so appreciate just, you know, yeah. coming on and spending the time. Yeah, man, I would say if you if you have young kids or know anybody who has young kids, 
ask them about it and they will get it immediately. Definitely. <laughs> like the need, yeah. the need, the need is real. So, Hey, I appreciate you having me on Wes. It's been a pleasure to be back with you. And uh, thanks for giving me the time. Absolutely, man. Always. Uh, hey, real quick, where can people learn more about Kiddo Kinetics? Where could they connect with you if they wanted to? Um, yeah, kiddokinetics.com is our website. You can reach out to me directly through there if you'd like, or my email is dpazgan at kiddokinetics.com. Feel free to reach out to me, you know, in person if you'd like. I'm a, like I said, we tend to be really hands on. So yeah. I don't have like a secretary screen in my calls or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the truth. Um, so yeah, and it's K I D O K I N E T I C S. I'll post links in the show notes and stuff like that to make it easy for yep. people. But um dave man i appreciate you thanks for everything that you're doing and thanks for dropping in on the path to freedom podcast awesome man thanks wes have a great weekend